Hi, I'm Brian Lambert, and welcome to The Facts as We Know Them, our bi-weekly review of the events and personalities vital to the state of Minnesota and our environs. As reported on by our trio of regular commentators, who are Eric Eskla of WCCO Radio, David Carr of the Twin Cities Reader, and Patrick Kessler of Minnesota Public Radio. This uh, is February, gentlemen, and February is a traditionally a time for uh, doldrums around uh, politics and the news in general. However, I think that uh, the news is heating up over at the uh, Federal Course Building in Minneapolis, where Miles Lord is weighing the advantages and disadvantages of hearing the Dalkon Shield case. Uh, David, you've been covering this for a while. It seems that Miles is now, uh, Miles is now into the uh, realm of uh, demanding loyalty oaths from people. Um, what's the... Well, there's nothing like Miles to break up a slow news week. Uh, <laughs> We are, after all, <clears throat> you walk into uh, the courtroom of Judge Lords, and it's, uh, it's a special kind of place, the land of miles, where, <laughs> where anything can happen and often does. Um, this, this week's Didn't action, he single you out uh, the other day? In, in well, Miles My, got a little problem with having strangers in his courtroom, especially ones that look like myself. I mean, you walk in, you know, who are you? Yes. No, he <laughs> said, sir, are you a juror? I answered, no, sir. Are you a lawyer? No, sir. Who are you? He said. And, this is and, a I, and I explained exactly who I this was. This is a courtroom filled with how many people? Mm, perhaps, perhaps, I don't know, 50, yeah, 60. Several thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Miles has got good eyes. The, the, the trial itself mm. uh, features uh, the Robbins people who manufactured the Dalkon Shield in 1971 through 1974. Uh, the plaintiffs in this case, there are five of 20 remaining. They were all consolidated together to speed up. There's, there's, there's four, and four or five hundred of these cases waiting to be tried. In this state? Yes. So Miles thought he'd fold them all together. Miles likes to make new law. He's created a new system here. He wants to fold them all together, uh, get a bunch of jurors, have the, uh, have the facts of the, uh, of the case, uh, whether, whether the product itself was defective or not, worked out in one early generic argument, and then these jurors will split up and decide the damages for each particular woman. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, Miles made it clear that he thought these guys from uh, Robbins were, were sleazy. <laughs> he said, I don't know who you people are. You come pinwheeling through here, all these different, all these different uh, lawyers. I don't know who the heck you are. So he decided... Are these attorneys from one particular part of the country, the Eastern they're all from the They're all from Virginia, and they're all people with excellent reputations who have uh, appeared before the Supreme Court, many district courts across the nation. But when they're in Miles, courtroom, they're going to sign an oath saying they will abide by the laws of Minnesota and respect the ethics. But the company, the company is, is uh, ready to sort of break up his, uh, his hold on the case. Uh, in other words, the company is ready to get rid of him or at least uh, loosen his controls on the whole business, right? That's correct. Uh, today they filed a writ which uh, asked uh, the Eighth Circuit to disqualify Miles. Is there anything unconstitutional in what he's trying to do with these oaths? Well, it's certainly unprecedented. Miles. Is, uh, is it unprecedented? I wondered about that, too. Uh, if it's unprecedented to ask people to uh, follow the statutes and laws of, of Minnesota, or also well, no, to what it, even to consolidate the cases, is that unprecedented, too? No, I, I don't I, think so. It's a uh, class action type of a Well, they right? serve yeah. at, his, at his leasure and convenience. Okay, at his, uh, it's called Pro Hoc Vici, and if he doesn't like them, out of here. What was uh, that called? Uh, Coca V. Pro, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. Pro Hoc Vici, these are three, the three only... only uh, Latin words, I know. Uh, the, the relationship has been a stormy one, and, and uh, today finally came to where they appealed to the Eighth Circuit saying, Miles, there's no question about where Miles is at, at this, in this case. We're not going to get a fair shake from these guys, and you better appoint a new judge. Well, in, the back, in the background of this, then, are the facts of the case similar? This is a, a birth control device that was used by women that apparently caused infertility and other health problems among many of the women who used it nationwide, not just in Minnesota. I mean, is there some dispute as to the facts in the case, or can you save time and uh, lawyers' fees by consolidating 
the, 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 the contents of fact in the case. It sounds like a good strategy to, to keep lawyers' fees to somewhat of a minimum and to speed it along. You bet. And, but uh, justice is, uh, when it comes to Miles' cor courtroom, justice is a, is a fluid thing. Big sleazy corporations, this is big corporations who, for that matter, uh, we all remember the, uh, you know, the TAC night reserve, uh, mining, reserve, reserve mining. mining fight. Uh, uh, Miles was pretty hard. Well, often, often in that case I, and in I, others, he he asks questions that the prosecutor. I, I have to stop here. Though, you know, I, you know I, 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 let it go, I let it go by for just a moment. But you've said it a couple times that you always use uh, when you say corporation or business, you always use big and sleazy together. I, I, I don't well, know why. Well, it's it, it, it's two weeks of education in Miles' courtroom. Uh, uh, corporations. Uh, De facto, is that Latin also? <laughs> <laughs> You're rolling <laughs> that. Our, um, Used to be an altar boy, didn't you, David? That he makes certain assumptions uh, about uh, corporations. Robbins, over time, to be fair to Judge Lord, has, uh, through their litigation, established a, a pattern of uh, delay, of obstinacy, of... Uh, they, uh, all, the, all the cases they've lost on this, they've paid out a total of $75,000 in punitive damages. So what, how many cases is that? Uh, well, there's 9,000. Uh, 5,000 which have settled out of court. See, the, uh, the plaintiffs... 5,000 settled out of court for a total of $75,000 no, in damages? No, no, excuse me. Uh, of the people that have taken their cases to court, yeah. only one person has got $75,000, right. and the rest are all on appeal. So all these women have won three, four million dollars, haven't seen a dime mm. of, of the money. It's... You know, another thing that I'm curious about is that, um, uh, is it just the advanced state of Minnesota uh, judicial system that uh, Minnesota and California have brought more of these cases to uh, trial than any other states? Well, the legal talent is here. The, uh, the people advertised, uh, drummed up a lot of interest in these cases. Uh, so there's a ton of them. Uh, each federal judge has been assigned 20 cases. Yeah. Well, Miles said, I'm going to fold all mine together. Well, as soon as they saw they had 20 cases in front of Miles, they started settling them just like that. They're down, they got down to three. Miles folded in two more. Now, I talked to uh, Joe Freeberg yesterday, and he said two of his cases. There's another lawyer in the case. What, yeah. what the big fight right here is he's, he's trying to open up uh, through the discovery process all these records which nobody else has been able to use. You know, I wonder if we, sh if we should linger for just a moment on, on something you mentioned, too. That is that lawyers have been advertising for these cases. Right. Right. Uh, asking women to write in, and uh, I, I don't know how many there have been. Do you, uh, do you know how many cases are, are considered uh, good cases or bad cases? How do they decide anything like that? Well, that's, that's certainly for the courts to decide. I'm not, oh, isn't that decided by the lawyers before it goes? It, well, if it goes for to one court, thing, if you, can't be, if you can't get more than 200K, 200,000 bucks, you're not walking in the door. It's a lawyer's holiday, isn't it? I mean, it's like a, well, yeah, walk in a candy store. That's what's been so fun for me yeah. in yeah. covering the trial is I've never seen so much talent in one room. <laughs> these guys from these guys from Virginia are amazing. Miles is uh, Judge Lord is 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 really on their case. They're a model of decorum, of courtesy, and of slickness. They're well, that's unbelievable. From, that's from the uh, the attorney's point of view. I think from the, the the judicial point of view in this case, you have a again Miles Lord as the classic role of the activist judge as opposed to an arbitrator who sits there and judges on the merits. I mean, again, I think you have Judge Lord in this case uh, taking up more of a, uh, an advocacy role, as he has done throughout his career. And how do you think this is going to play with the, the, justice, uh, the judges of the Eighth Circuit when they decide his, uh, his fitness for the case? How do you think it's going to come down? Well, I think that uh, over time they've, uh, there's been an uh, organic development of how to handle Miles. Yeah. Miles is there. He's to be he's to be dealt with. Um, I, I think he is a special case, and they, they treat him as such. The, the, the one thing about when you when you're in his courtroom, he seems to be throwing off things left and right casually. Um, the man is brilliant. Mm -hmm. He has an excellent legal yeah. mind. Yeah, he does. He covers his base as well. Uh, he he makes good laws with some exception. If um, we, we have to say he's the most, one of the most controversial district court judges in the country. Too. Well, this is the man who revels in his uh, so, description uh, of him as the modern know, um, for every, Judge Lloyd Bean. You know. For every person, yeah. for every David <clears throat> Carr that says he's a, a, a great genius and a legal mind, there are probably yes. uh, another person who would say he's a... He's he has a, American Lawyer Magazine calling him the, the worst well, judge. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's won in, other people, in yeah. the same year. He's won best uh, trial judge and yeah. worst trial judge, depending on the group of lawyers voting. I am voting. over and over mm -hmm. stunned by the things he says in court. Yeah. <laughs> he's uninhibited. You can he'll say be that. Saying, he'll Someone ought to put out a book, you know, the you know, mile speak or something. The, these gentlemen uh, from Robinson Larson who are representing these women uh, 
were complaining about uh, that, that a couple of the company uh, people weren't being forthcoming. Miles just piped right up and said, I know, you won't get anything out of <laughs> They won't answer a question for, you know. Do we know when the Eighth Circuit's going to rule on his uh, fitness for this? Uh, 5.30 today. Okay. Uh, all right. And um, when is the first trial? I mean, when the, what is the expected date of the first trial? Well, it just and keeps, I, the, the whole thing might be out of bed as yeah. of today. Or um, what, uh, what is more likely to happen is none of these women will ever see trial in front of Miles Lord. Because if I had a case, if I was Robbins, I'd settle. Yeah. Mm. Period. Mm. Mm. All right. Um, Eric, uh, the um, U.S. Senate uh, race here in Minnesota is in its formative stages. There's a lot of jockeying around and some, I think some uh, important uh, decisions might be uh, being made at this very moment based on a poll that was released this last week. Um, uh, I would seem that James Oberstar got the big kick out of uh, the recent uh, poll results. Yeah, big, a big week and a much needed big week for uh, Congressman uh, James Oberstar and his Senate campaign at the expense really of Joan Groh and Wendell Anderson. Uh, the two chief opponents in the race for DFL Senate endorsement to face uh, Republican Rudy Boschwitz, the incumbent. Uh, Oberstar's uh, polar, a guy named James Lauer of Alexandria, Virginia, d interviewed 610 Minnesotans at the uh, last couple days of January, and uh, he found that uh, among DFL voters, Oberstar does the best against Boschwitz, among uh, Gro, Anderson, and Oberstar. Oberstar d does the best. But he's only within about 12 points of Boschwitz, and all the three DFLers lose to Boschwitz. Mm -hmm. He also found that in primary style heats, uh, Oberstar beats uh, Anderson and Grow pretty well. Uh, and it speaks to the uh, Oberstar claim again and again. His campaign has said, we have the most electable candidate, that we have a liberal pro-choice uh, fellow who has been in the House for uh, 10 years who will be able to debate Boschwitz issue for issue and will be a, a coalition type of candidate that can win a broad range of, of DFL voters. Uh, it, it was bad for Anderson, I think, because I think everybody's had a feeling that Wendy's campaign was really coming on, that he was, uh, in a sense, the, the dark horse that could be everybody's uh, coalition compromise choice at a deadlock DFL convention. But what this poll that uh, Mr. Lauer did showed was that uh, Anderson has a lot of negatives, high name identification, 90 Surprise, some, surprise. Yeah, mm -hmm. but a ton of negatives over his self-appointment and so forth. Jeez. And so it, uh, and it also showed that Grow, uh, in, in one of the questions was, uh, among DFLers who both, who like and know Oberstar and Joan Grow, who do you think is the most electable? And by 51 to 26 or something, those people said, Oberstar. So it hurt Anderson. It furthered Oberstar, I think, to the fact that he's got the most electability. From the Boschwitz point of view, good news for him, his positive rating was 54 percent, and the Reagan positive rating was 57 percent, hmm. which I think was better than Carter, or maybe is a high-water hmm. Carter mark in Minnesota. May I ask okay. you something? Yeah. What, uh, who do you think Boschwitz wants? I asked that question to Scott Coddington. Uh, who was Boschwitz campaign uh, chief. He said that we know what to expect if we run against Wendy. We did it before, we could do it again, we know what we could... <laughs> he said with Oberstar and Grow, it's very much unknown. Who knows what kind of a campaign they can come up with. But it was a big week for Oberstar, uh, and you can tell how good something is by uh, uh, the effort they make to get it out. They called uh, Patrick late uh, 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 midweek afternoon when it came out, they called me at home. They called the newspapers. Uh, I never got a call. Did Pat you, Forcia, <laughs> No, Pat, I must have fell off the list. Pat Forcia, the campaign manager overstar, said he called every outstate paper he could think of. They've mailed out 8,000 copies of this thing to uh, potential delegates to the convention. Well, and then they followed that up. Okay. They followed that up. He'll, he'll call you later. <laughs> <laughs> they, they followed that up then with, uh, with a letter to the chief of the Minnesota DFL party challenging all the other DFL candidates to a debate. Now, this is a, a major change in Oberstar's position because Oberstar has been the one up until now who has said, we're not going to fight. We're all Democrats. Uh, we're all Democrats. Let's just uh, stick close together the and we're against that bad guy. Yeah, the, tw the, the 11th <laughs> commandment, yeah. <laughs> the, Thou shalt speak no ill of other Democrats. Right. And uh, now he wants to debate them. He's thinking that, uh, that he's looking pretty good. And if Oberstar debated Gro or Anderson, it, he'd rip them to shreds. He's a Woody? remarkable speaker. He's a remarkable speaker. Mm. Yeah, I think and, and is this poll line. terrible on TV? Is this poll that, significant against, ba uh, based on the fact that it was generated by Oberstar well, to uh, really shake then, up anything within the Democratic Party? It just gave him a little boost because he's yeah. been flagging. Uh, people have said that he's not really connecting with delegates one on one. That when he schmoozes with them, he's not really a palsy, wowsy type of guy. Mm. Uh, Gross people said that our poll shows us doing much better than Oberstar shows. Boschwitz's poll says we're 30 points ahead of any Democrat, not 12 percent like this one shows. So uh, it was just a case of, of Oberstar needing a shot in the arm and this giving it to him. Now, uh, this coming week, 
uh, there's going to be a meeting with Oberstar people, with labor people. They're going to try to mend some fences. You remember in December, Oberstar couldn't get that right. AFL-CIO endorsement from Dave Rowe, blocking it, many thought, because he owed Wendy Anderson a favor. I heard something very interesting about that, uh, a rumor that came from the head of COPE, the Committee, uh, Committee on Political Education from the National AFL-CIO, who said that now, get, a lot of alphabets here, now the National Organization <laughs> for Women put pressure on the Minnesota AFL-CIO not to endorse Oberstar because of his pro-life stand. And Judy Goldsmith, the head of NOW, the national head of NOW, said that if the Minnesota AFL-CIO would endorse Oberstar and his pro-life stand for Senate, the Mondale NOW endorsement would be in jeopardy. You heard it here oh, first, boy. I think. What a, what what a think, jumble. Huh? What a jumble. Could you diagram you that for us? <laughs> you know, there, there's, so, there's something else uh, that has to do uh, kind of with that. It, everybody's saying, you, you asked Brian if, if the poll uh, can be taken seriously because yeah. he's coming out of his campaign. Well, first of all, he released something that doesn't show him winning the election, so that's... Uh, that is one sense. These people don't lie to their, their candidates, the, the polling people. Something we should remember, though, is that the, the DFL candidates are bunched very close together, according to this poll. Yeah. There's a 5% margin of error either way, which means that any one of those candidates could be way ahead of the other uh, the, by as much as 10 percentage points. And the significant thing for Boschwitz is that he beats any of them. And his no matter which way it falls. And his approval right. rating, yeah, even within the margin of error, and his yeah. approval rating, 54, is excellent. And Reagan's approval rating is fine. Excellent, in fact, strong, so that if Mondale is the head of the, the Democratic ticket presidentially, you think that helps Minnesotans, but Minnesotans who uh, ticket split, and they're noted for that, uh, that Reagan positive rating should give pause to Minnesota DFLers, I think. Bosch was oh, in, the, in the Senate, then. I, I, I wonder if you could uh, answer me. Why does Overstar not look good on television? I mean, you've seen Joan Gross. She wears this lovely red outfit. She wears so, red, so, yeah. so much similar to what you're wearing. Overstar like that, comes on TV. And I add Jim's question, what are Joan Gross negatives? I mean, well, uh, the, the, the very things that play good for Joan Groh among some constituents, woman, pro-choice, mm -hmm. hurt her in, in other parts of the state where mm -hmm. they don't want to vote for a woman. I, I talked to somebody who's doing some pre-polling for the Minnesota poll where they're doing questions about women, and uh, he, this person indicated to me that he thought it looked very bad for Joan Groh just based on some pre-polling in the Minnesota poll they had done because uh, Minnesotans didn't seem too fired up about a, a woman candidate, at least well, in some well, parts of the state. But why does the highly touted Jim Overstar not come across on TV. He's not a he's not a, a backslapper. He's not a glad hander. Yeah. He's a very well, intellectual. That what works on TV? There are a couple things. There are a couple things to the point about it, uh, about Jim Oberstar. Uh, he's he's a brilliant man. He's a very very intelligent man. He speaks uh, what four or five languages? I well, think. Well, I think he speaks seven. Yeah, he's a, and, that's uh, going to uh, do he's, him a lot of good real, up on the range. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it will. Doesn't speak <laughs> well, his French is incredible. Yeah, it will he's, do he's it well have, on the range. He's going to have to speak all the languages up there. He gets in a stem one steel. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, he starts getting into a stem winder, and he just winds him up and waves oh, his good. arms, and he's a great speaker. Yeah, he's a white Jesse Jack. He is really something, this guy. And he, he, next to uh, Joan Groh, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd beat her hands down. Well, he just knows the issues because he's had all that Washington yeah. exposure to him. Uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy's speech to the DFL Central Committee a, a month or so ago was excellent. Very good. Home run. But the same yeah. speech, I'm told by more than just uh, one person, has not played that well out in Albert Lee or some of the outstate areas where he said, remember me, the golden era, uh, they still remember that self-appointment more outstate than in the DFL Central Committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pat Forsey, again, Overstar's campaign uh, chairman, says that the farther you get away from the Central Committee, the worse Grow's support is. Okay, and then, mm -hmm. and then you can take that, and then you can also say that Overstar is having problems south of Forest Lake, Minnesota. He's having a real hard time picking up people yeah. in Twin Cities and Southern Minnesota. Joan Grow's strength is in the Twin Cities and out uh, to Western Minnesota. I don't Minnesota. have a feeling that Overstar has made uh, much of a uh, personal um, uh, impact appearance-wise in the Twin Cities. He's got to be, right? he's again, he's again, be, what the, what he's he's be on Capitol Hill. He's a, he's a working congressman. Yeah. Joan Grow, and this is what the Overstar... The high road isn't going to help Well, him. here's what Overstar people are going to say about Joan Grow. Here's this commission. Uh, that has said that uh, for the past uh, how many years it's been, 10, Joan Groves has been in a, a job that shouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> You're talking about the state commission to abolish the uh, secretary of yeah. state and the treasury's job. Well, yeah. it's, it's interesting, and they're going to say, well, she's able to campaign full time because she's in a job that should be abolished. So we're on Capitol Hill doing our votes and doing our constituent work, and it's been a problem. And they're, they're very cognizant of the fact that they've mm -hmm. not connected well one on one with the delegates. And Oberstar, I know, is calling them now, the uh, potential delegates. Uh, but uh, Joan Groh is doing very well still, and she's a very potent candidate. This was just a something and a week that Overstar needed a boost. He got one. And yeah. I think it... Do you get the feeling Eric's kind of plugged in on this uh, Senate stuff? 
it, he he knows his turf. They're going to they're yeah. This is uh, if this is um, uh, the election year in the mind of the Democrats, uh, it would seem that based on uh, uh, Senate Minority Leader Jim Ewan's um, uh, paper this week, that uh, the prospects for the Republicans in the next decade are bright indeed. We're going to win, he says. Yeah. That's what he says. Uh, Jim Ewan uh, states flatly that he expects the Republicans to be in control of the legislature, certainly the Minnesota Senate, but of the legislature by the late 1980s. How many times have we heard that? Well, they have a pretty good. Uh, they pretty would have good to make chance. up how many seats now? Uh, oh, yeah. You had to ask me. I'd have to subtract. <laughs> no, they are 11 seats behind, mm -hmm. and uh, so they'd have to make up that. The DFL would have to lose 11, and they would have to gain 12. And they've already targeted these seats. They've already targeted uh, the seats for the 1986 Senate elections. Uh, they know which which districts they're going to concentrate on. They know which districts. Uh, the, the issues they're going to have in each district, and they think they have a very good chance of winning in the Minnesota Senate. Are they going to run against Perpich, or are they going to run against the big spending DFL-led dominated legislature? Well, the very, they have a number <clears throat> of things that uh, might sound surprising, but what they're going to run on is that uh, the Republicans are the party of the people. If, uh, for example, <laughs> that's interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, no, I, mean, right? I, I, I laugh only because that is a twist. Let me tell you, if I ask you uh, what is the party of big business, I suspect most people on the street would say the Democrats yeah. or the Republicans. Pardon me. Um, it's not but true. Look it's how the Democrats. Look how Perpich has, has really gone to bed with those. The people. Democrats are the party of big We're business in this state. The, of More, right. the, the biggest business contributions and the biggest business yeah. and the most money goes to Democrats in the state, not Republicans. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're Excellent going on point. that. They're going on, on that idea Very that insightful. we are the party of, uh, of blue-collar workers, and it, it apparently, according to contributions anyway, they are. Well, anyway, he states flatly that Republicans are going to be in control of the legislature, and he has come out with an 83-page um, plan on, uh, on what the <laughs> legislature should pass. That? <laughs> Did you read it? Well, it took me about four days. No, I, well, Have yeah, you trouble I, sleeping? <laughs> it's on a computer, even. You know, they put it out on a computer. Well, uh, <laughs> it's an exercise in intellectual. The IBM compatible. Right. It's it's an exercise in intellectual uh, futility. Mm -hmm. It really is because you cannot. That's never happened. At ha the state tell me this, Pat. Before. No, they, it hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> have they uh, uh, tried to isolate a particular um, um, uh, constituency areas, whatever else that they think of the uh, their target area? You said they've got the target. Yes. Uh, it, it, the women. Women. Youth. And uh, Youth. Hmm. and uh, blue collar workers. And, and and now it sounds funny to say, but those are the areas where they believe that they have done much more than the Democrats in Minnesota. Look at uh, women, the hiring of women and minorities. The Republicans have the, have the Democrats uh, uh, beaten hands down on that. That's true. On, uh, on things like um, on blue-collar workers, it's the Republicans who believe that they have the programs that most directly affect and help blue-collar workers. Now, it's the Democrats who have pushed through all the tax increases. Not one Republican. Why do I get this strange feeling we've entered the twilight zone? Right? Well, it's it's very interesting, isn't it? Um, if if you look back uh, 12 Weird, months, what it is. you'll find that not one Republican voted for a tax increase. Not one in the last 12 months, and it's all the Democrats that have pushed it through. That's what they're going to take to the people, not only this year in the House of Representatives, but in 1986. Yeah, taking the broader view of this, Patrick, it seems to me that Uland uh, is looking very much to the future because the Republicans don't have votes really to block much in this session but they can make a lot of good political points for the fall campaigns in the House That's and right. then for 86 when they'll be running a governor and, 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 and a governor that, governor's candidate that could be named James Uland. Right. Jim Uland is uh, on the fast track for the candidate for governor. He wants to do that. He's too liberal, isn't he, to get past a Republican convention in the Well, state? no, I don't think anybody can run against Rudy Purpich. No, I'm talking 1984. I'm talking, right now, I'm talking nomination, uh, endorsement, Republican endorsement. I don't think a James Uland, given the makeup of those conservative Republican people delegates... People know who he is. Well, no, he, he's he's uh, risen in the ranks rapidly, though. Over the he's Let's only talk been in a little the, bit about who he is. Jim Uland is the uh, Republican Senate leader, the leader of the minority in the Minnesota Senate, a man from Duluth who uh, became a senator uh, only about six years ago. Uh, when when the minority leader resigned two years ago, Jim Uland, to the surprise of uh, many many people, including yeah. myself was elected minority leader, which makes him the chief spokesperson for the Republicans in the and Senate. And he's had kind of a... He wants to run for governor. He's had kind of a weird... Uh, he's a Republican in an area where he's the only Republican for miles and miles and miles. In a very strong Democratic district. Uh, he is a, 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 tree, a Christmas tree farmer. He's been uh, photographed naked in some of the weekly uh, news magazines. What? Uh, wasn't he? It seems to me that he, <laughs> well, he was walking around, the, this one. He was oh, walking oh, around yeah. the Capitol nude or something uh, uh, in the mid-70s. <laughs> oh, it's a famous missed, story. I, you I were not there then, but it's a famous... I used to live in Duluth, and I, I, I covered him there. No, I, I think I recall that, yeah. And it's, it's a famous <laughs> legend of... Yeah. Uh, 
He's, he's, he's a graduate he's a, of the Wharton, Wharton School. Wharton School. Yeah. He, he was seen running with the bear through the whole Shell Duluth. Well, right? yeah. Wharton well, School of Business in uh, Pennsylvania. We're, we're getting off the track, but basically mm. what we're saying is that uh, Jim Newland is one of uh, a couple Republicans who are, have their eye on the, on the governor's chair in 1986. Another one is Arnie Carlson. Again, too liberal to get an mm. endorsement, I think. Right. Uh, Do you think so? Glenn Sherwood's minions will come marching in. You know. I don't think the Republican <clears> Party, uh, the, the majority of Republicans in the state, are really conservative. Uh, yeah, I think I the think delegates are. And I think I don't think those the conventions. Are young I don't think professionals mm, like Pat. I don't think that convention is ready. <laughs> <laughs> the convention is not ready for a Uland or a Carlson yet. Maybe in, in '86, yes, but I don't think if it were. They're very conservative. Well, the whole, I think. The, um, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say the whole idea of this is that they're looking forward to the 1986 elections. Right now, nobody's going to be running against Rudy Perpich. She's popular among Democrats and Republicans. However, uh, uh, they they're, they have exactly what they want to do planned out right now. And a lot of people are laughing at him for, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I saw an editorial cartoon of the Republicans holding out their, uh, their legislative package, and there was a Democratic legislator holding, holding out a wastebasket for them to throw it in. So <laughs> throw it you know. But they uh, can make enough political points this year to help them in sure, the fall. Sure, sure. I think uh, in the minds of a lot of people this time of year, uh, bound as we are with snow drifts and uh, slush everywhere, a far more important issue is whether the twins are going to stay in Minnesota. Well, we, uh, we have a uh, we have a big. we yeah. have a commission. Yes, another one of uh, the governor's uh, commission studies. Seven hundred and fifty commissioners. There was a real unfortunate mm -hmm. quote in the paper uh, in the last week or so that said that well, uh, from the head of the twins ticket commission, saying that well, we'll be satisfied with one point three million. Well, that would be even below the twins' all-time record attendance. And remember, they need two point four million to to salvage the lease mm -hmm. to prevent the twins from moving legally. Well, the twins told me today that that uh, the fellows that said that were misquoted that all they were trying to say is that they, they would have a base of 1.3 million in season tickets and then in gate sales sounds, would generate the other right. million. Now that is not an, at all true. And this is Dick Pomerantz who yeah. is, who's but, uh, this. Well, this was told mm -hmm. me by the twins and, and the... A master of the semantics. Pomerantz is claiming that Doug Rome has quoted him. I don't know yeah, if he did yeah. or not, but this is what Pomerantz is claiming. You gotta know. Um, mm -hmm. They went on a tour of all the major league cities. Uh, I think they came back with realism stamped on their forehead. Uh, <laughs> I, I honestly don't, don't they think that 1.3 million is the number that will attract at least an, another owner? I mean, that that's a, uh, yeah. a may, suitable enough maybe. attendance to. Uh, but the twins say that at 1.3 they would move. Mm -hmm. you, know, they, they, you know, another interesting number I think that came up was the, the value of the twins. Now, I mean, uh, there's a there's Mar sorry. Marvin Davis, that that Denver oil man who was trying to get every kind of franchise into Denver. Forty million now is what he he and his backers are oh, ready to put no, up for. I didn't for. hear that. Forty really? mil. Yeah. This is Marvin Davis. Remember the name. He tried to buy he Oakland. Owns 20th from, Century Fox. He mm -hmm. tried to build to buy Oakland from Charlie Finley. Mm -hmm. Not the team. The whole town. He's <laughs> <laughs> a wealthy man. Uh, uh, so the the twins have a little bit of a problem here. Uh, I did talk to Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball. No, did you? Yeah, when I was in New York with Killebrew. I don't want to drop a name. Yeah, Bowie. <laughs> yeah. Eric, my and friend Eric. And in New York. You BK, double E, how are you? Uh -huh. we, no. have a couple, we have about a minute left, gentlemen. He, he, but he said that he, he hopes that, uh, he thinks the Twins will stay, that the American League won't allow them to move, yeah. and that towns like Denver and Tampa, St. Pete would get expansion teams. But, he, it's, but it's still up in the air. Kuhn said, Kuhn said that to me. Expansion. Yeah. Hmm. Um, uh, uh, one man who is not expanding, who is, uh, who is uh, contracting, but is Joe Souchere. Nice transition, Brian. Yes. Uh, the, uh, talked to him on the phone today. A little less heavy than Bowie, but, uh, <laughs> uh, But he took your call. Uh, as folks probably know, yesterday he got his column taken away from him. Uh, he, he, uh, said, his words were, I made every effort to do what I could to keep my job, uh, but I've come to believe that it's just an illusion that journalism means anything. So is country. he going to stay at the paper or not? Joe's, what? Is he going to stay at the paper no, or move on? No, probably not. He I heard stay. a rumor okay. that was Pat Royce had uh, an offer. Fort Lauderdale. Mm-hmm. And that Sush would go to St. Paul. More trading in this? The Rubik's Cube. Yeah, know? absolutely. Thank you. That's our um, show for this, uh, this week. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of The Facts as We Know Them. Good night.